All right, we'll just give another couple seconds to let people join in. For those of you joining, thank you for being here. Um, to let you know ahead of time before we do formal introductions, uh, this is being recorded uh, as a webinar. You'll find that your, your audio and video are turned off. Only the panelists are gonna be able to have audio and video on during this time. But if you wanna write questions in the chat box, we will have that open and in the end, we will uh, definitely view those for discussion. I'll mention that one more time in the proper introduction in just a minute. few people already in. It right, seems like it's a good time to start. So uh, first and foremost, hello everyone. I'm Mackenzie Lane Lightfoot and I'm an information professional here at the Leroy Collins Main Library. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague Nellie Barron, uh, who's also an information professional down at the Dr. BLP, uh, BL Perry Library. And we'd like to welcome everyone to the Untold Stories in Leon County's Black History webinar. Uh, we'd also like to introduce our incredible lineup of speakers for the event. Uh, Dr. Nasheed Madhuwan grew up in a uh, small historic town of Helena, Arkansas, which has a rich cross-section of important historical periods, which includes Civil War, African-American leadership during Reconstruction, and gospel and blues music heritage. He has served as the director of the Stax Museum of American Soul Music and Texas State History Museum. Art Museum and Archives of Hampton University, and is now the director of the Carrie Meek and James Eaton Senior Southeastern Regional Black Archives Research Center and Museum of Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. He served on a host of boards and public service commissions, including uh, the Blues Foundation, the Austin Arts Council, Arkansas Black History Commission, Virginia State Heritage Preservation Board, and the Florida Cultural Heritage, Rural, and Nature Committee. Dr. Reginald K. Ellis. Uh, is an associate professor at the history, uh, sorry, of history, I apologize, and the assistant dean in the School of Graduate Studies and Research at Florida A&M University. Uh, Dr. Ellis specializes in history of historically black colleges and universities, also called HBCUs, and African American leaders during the Jim Crow era. His first manuscript entitled Between Washington and Du Bois, uh, the Racial Politics of James Edward Shepard, which is an analytical biography of the founding president of the North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. It was published in 2017 by the University Press of Florida. In 2018, Ellis co-edited the anthology, The Seed Time, The Work and the Harvest, New Perspectives on the Black Freedom Struggle in America with Jeffrey Litterjohn and Peter Levy. And last but not least, there is Dr. Darius Young, in and who's an associate yeah, I cannot use my words I'm sorry who's an associate professor of history and the co-director of the Meek Eaton Center for Social and Political Justice at Florida A&M University. He's also the author of Robert R. Church Jr. and the African American Political Struggle which was published by University Press of Florida in 2019. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded throughout only the panels will be able to share video and audio. However, if you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat and we will bring them up at the end for presenters to discuss. That said, I'd like to hand things off to our first speaker, Dr. Medjuan. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, I am happy to be here and look forward to sharing uh, an untold story and uh, often overlooked landmark we have here in Tallahassee and uh, take some questions and see if we can have a discussion. Um, so behind me in the backdrop, you see a light blue building with uh, columns and uh, white trim. That is the historic Union Bank and it is standing right now uh, at the corner of Appalachia and Calhoun. So between Calhoun and Monroe, on Appalachia, 2119. Uh, you can see the building and visit it post COVID. <laughs> so you can uh, visit the building and we at the uh, Black Archives use it as a satellite site for African-American art and rotate uh, single host shows. But it has a broader history. It is on the National Register of Historic Places uh, for a variety of reasons actually. Uh, right now it stands as the oldest bank, standing bank in Florida. It was uh, incorporated in the 1830s. Um, it was constructed and built in 1841. Well, as you know, Florida history, then you know that 
Florida was still a territory at that time. 1845 became a state. And the bank itself is a part of two major bookends in um, slave history in Florida and representative of slavery and freedom, the freedmen across the South. So here we go. In the late 1700s, the world really recognized that the slave trade was horrific. Uh, the Middle Passage, uh, you know, we're losing uh, more uh, money than, than the, um, is, uh, is worth it and, and is inhumane. We, we heard that story over and over again. Um, but the United States was still faced with an economic issue. In 1807, actually in 1807, uh, to this day, um, British, the British passed a law to um, abolish the slave trade. And then the following week in March, um, the United States followed suit. So it's 1807. So you don't have the American slave trade anymore, but you still have the need for this free labor. And the United States in the South was being viewed, his economy was doubling and tripling uh, by this global economy, the cotton industry. And with the um, cotton gin, it grew exponential in the industrial revolution and in Europe and the need for textiles, meaning clothing and that type of uh, industry. You know, it, it was no way that the South was going to let the idea of an internal slave trade that emerged go. So this union bank was used to uh, allow mortgages on slaves as property. Interest, interesting enough, look at the numbers, $800 was the value, the average value of, uh, of a slave um, in the 1830s and 1840s. And that would be uh, at the tip of your scale at about um, for a 19 year old male, right? 18, 19 year old male. That's worth about $23,000 today. That's an incredible investment. And with that, you have fugitive slave trade issues and laws that translate later after the Civil War to black codes that would allow or try to hinder African Americans from leaving plantations. So we're moving through the Civil War and the bank is closed. It reopens in the 1860s as a Freedmen's Bureau. So the United States enacted uh, several laws um, that would help disperse clothing and food uh, to the, the newly freed uh, enslaved. But it also opened a private corporation, a private company, Free, Freedmen's Bank Savings and Trust. The trust, that's an interesting word here. Um, but the issue now, you have, you, you fix your labor issue in the 1840s, 50s with an internal slave trade and forced reproduction. And we still know about those horrific stories. But now after slavery is, is um, illegal in the 1860s, you still have cotton is king. Cotton was king from the 1830s to 1930s. So how does cotton remain king? There's a term called debt peonage. Peonage and paternalism is the collection of terms there, but there's a cycle of debt. If you are a sharecropper or a tenant farmer, meaning that you've negotiated the right to continue to work on that land, maybe you feared moving north or leaving that area because you're familiar with this area, the, the planter could impose a series of fear tactics or understandings so that in the fall when you have settling time, when you have this, this period when you come to the table and you look at the debts that you have against how much money you've raised for the planter, there should be a balance coming to you. There should be a balance coming to you. And oftentimes that balance was communicated as zero. And if it's communicated zero or you owe me $200, then you can't leave until that debt is paid. It's called debt peonage, the cycle of debt. One of the major ways that uh, this could be avoided is to provide an, an, a safe haven, a trust, a place where these freedmen could go deposit their money. 
Okay, so there were more than 30 offices uh, across the South, uh, 17 banks erected. This building was one used as one of these very important banks. And it was headed up by Frederick Douglass, um, you know, a major intellectual icon for the time period. He saw the value of this entity up until the mid 1870s. And you can go to the National Archives now and look at some of these bank records, but not just the bank records uh, that communicate the deposits, that the bank records share siblings. If, if, if uh, one, one particular bank record that I remember of Diane Taylor in 1870 was February 1st. Um, she de deposited, I believe, fifty dollars. The average was actually five to fifty dollars, which was eight hundred. Um, was it eighty to eight hundred dollars in, in today's uh, value? But it would say that she considered herself almost black. Well, now you know there's some lineage there. She considered us her occupation is, at the age of forty was a washer, and it listed her siblings, her children, and her parents. So now we have a geneal genealogical record. The reason the record had to be so detailed is because we have to be able to identify who that is. Uh, the bank supervisor would sign Diane Taylor or whoever's name and Diane Taylor who could not write would make her X, make her mark, okay? Consider the times, these were newly freed uh, people and so Reading and writing was not as pervasive as it is today. Some could understand, but they did understand the value of banking. They did understand the value of savings. And remarkably, what I noticed through the records that the majority of the records were women. Women uh, saw fit and Diane Taylor and a few that I mentioned and several other of the deposits that were made that, over the 100,000, more than 100,000 deposits made across the 17 banks, 10% were made in Tallahassee at this union bank. Regionally, the deposits represent from individuals from South Carolina, of course, Florida, uh, Alabama, Georgia, um, and there were a few from Louisiana. And making that trek to Tallahassee, first, was arduous. It, it was, you know, you, you know, we don't have trains and planes and automobiles uh, as we do now. So you, 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 you have to realize how important it was to deposit this money. Unfortunately, unfortunately, since this was a private corporation, it was a private bank, although issued by the United States, the bank had the right to make investments and run out of Washington, D.C. There were several gentlemen who saw fit to make investments uh, against the, um, the economic panic in 1871 and the bank went bankrupt. And all the money that was entrusted by uh, these individuals who came from all the different states we've mentioned, lost the money. There was an entity set up by legislation to repay uh, the money's lost to the individuals, but less than 5% was recouped. You know, finding your way to get the information, finding your way to write and fill out the paperwork, and you're, you, you, you may or may not be able to read or write and get it to Washington, D.C., and then now you have a new trust issue. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people and historians argue that this was the foundation of a trust issue and... Um, you know, the black and brown communities. Either way, that notwithstanding, this bank represents two bookends of, of uh, American history, of African American history, and it stands as the oldest bank in Florida, and uh, we welcome you to visit, and so we'll take some questions from you. To remind everyone before we move to uh, Dr. Ellis, you, if you have any questions, please feel free to click the chat bubble on the bottom left uh, or at the bottom of your screen should be there and type in any questions you have. And uh, at the end of the presentations, we can have discussions about that. So there are none at this time, but just letting you know. I'm sorry, Dr. Ellis, we, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh... 
Thank you for that great presentation, Dr. Matt Ewan. Thank you all for having me uh, this afternoon. Um, today, I'm going to speak very briefly on um, an individual who I think is very important to the uh, not only the history of what is now Fort a &M University, but also the city of Tallahassee and the state, the state of Florida and the southeastern region of the United States of America as it relates to the development uh, or the, uh, the movement of African Americans in this region from one class, uh, from the working class into the middle and even perhaps the professional class uh, here uh, in the South uh, Eastern region of the United States of America. Uh, so my, my talk is uh, uh, loosely entitled Fancy in the Gray Years 1944 uh, until 1949. And so I'll be uh, jumping right into the presentation midway uh, through uh, the overall concept the the role that William H. Gray uh, had on the development of the university. Uh, and this comes at the end uh, or at the end of the life of our third president, uh, Dr. John Robert Edward Lee. After the loss of FAMC's uh, fourth president, uh, J.R.E. Lee, the State Board of Control appointed Juby B. Bragg, then head of athletics as acting president. Although Bragg was familiar with the school and well equipped for the position, the board believed that uh, they would better obtain candidates by conducting a broader search for an administrator who they did not have any previous connections to FAMC. At their intense hunt for a new president that ended on June 8th, 1944, the Board of Control tentatively selected Dr. William H. Gray as the, president, as the college's fifth president. Gray's reputation in education reached Tallahassee by way of his connection with Daniel E. Williams, State Superintendent for Negro Education, and Doak S. Campbell, President of Florida State University. Lee Dale Neelan reveals in his work that Williams knew of Gray's work in Louisiana and the Florida Normal Industrial School, which is present-day Florida Memorial University, while Campbell reported that he visited FNIC twice during Gray's tenure as president and observed changes which indicated he was performing an outstanding duty as president there. Many of the board members were impressed with Gray as a person and educator, but held one reservation. Their hesitation came on the part of Gray's age. It appeared that that age worked against Gray being named president of the college without the tentative label placed, being placed on his title. Moreover, the appointment uh, was made under a, a probation period where Williams was to perform annual checkups on Gray. After four months of observation by Williams, Gray was advised to take office on September 1st, 1944, 10 days before his 43rd birthday. As highlighted in the history of FAMU, uh, the transition period between Lee and Gray produced two extremes. President Lee had the distinction of being one of the oldest college presidents in the nation, and the other extreme, Gray, held the distinction of being one of the youngest. Although Gray was their chief, uh, although age rather was their chief difference, both men held the belief that an institution of higher education must expand and expand and render wider educational services if it was to justify uh, efficient, effectively why it belongs as a college in the United States of America. Although Lee left a large shadow, he also left the institution in great condition for a successor. And building upon the foundations of Lee, Grace successfully spearheaded a small but noticeable period of expansion at the college. One of the efforts was to, was to secure a new health and nursing education center that Lee began in 1938. The promotion was, uh, the program rather, was aided by Dr. Leonard Foote, who Gray personally asked to lead the cause and to enlist other, other support groups from the state and local officials and agencies in raising uh, a hospital fund for uh, more than a million dollars. When Gray assumed the presidency, the college, like other institutions of higher learning in Florida, was suffering from the abnormalities created by wartime living. 
prior to Gray's arrival at FAMC, there had been there had not been major buildings erected on campus for nearly 20 years. Furthermore, the school lost many influential faculty members to better uh, to better paying uh, uh, positions in wartime industry, and the student body declined noticeably. Nonetheless, FAMC's new president was able to utilize his political connections to enhance the educational experiences of the new college. Specifically, during World War II, Gray was in charge of the Florida Area War Manpower Program, a federal program uh, program for shipyard workers, which eventually helped to jumpstart new building constructions during the during his administration. These buildings included Pocahontas Village and the new hospital facility. Pocahontas Village was built to accommodate and assist veterans in the process of readjustment and rehabilitation to civilian life. During Gray's second year, the state government, uh, the state government, along with the Veterans Hosp uh, Housing Authority, provided financial support for building a veterans housing project on the campus to hold 107, 170 housing units for married veterans and 11 barracks to be renovated into living quarters for 250 single veterans. Gray chose uh, Professor M. R. Kyle uh, of the Department of Mathematics to chair the committee that was charged with naming the housing facility. The individual that received the honor had to be a former student and graduate or former student or graduate of the college who through, the heroic, through their heroic actions died during the war. The name that was submitted to Gray was First Lieutenant James R. Pokenhorn of Pensacola. Pokenhorn was selected because he was the first, Af uh, the first FAMCian rather to be accepted into the Air Corps and to receive wings at the Tuskegee Army Flying School on February 16, 1943. Soon after receiving his wings, his squadron of P-36 fighter planes were lost on May 5, 1944. On the uh, on a uh, mission uh, in Italy, Dr. Gray chose homecoming 1948 as the official dedication of the Pokenhorn Village. The program keynote speaker for was the Honorable Robert R. Gray, Robert A. Gray, uh, Florida Secretary of State. One of the most significant structures uh, that President Gray fought for during his tenure was the hospital. In a report, a FAMC alum. Gray proclaimed that the need to finish the job of Lee, which was so near to the late president's heart. The Alumni Association assured Gray that they would do everything in his power, but could make no promises. In a sign of good faith, however, the association raised $5,000, which included 500 uh, that Lee previously secured. In an effort to raise, uh, to, to continue raising funds, Gray informed uh, Fund the, the fundraising committee with Dr. Leonard Foote and himself as co formed the uh, fundraising committee with Dr. Leonard Foote and himself as co chairman. Uh, both Foote and Gray won the support of Governor Caldwell, the Board of, Board of Education and Board of Control, the State Improvement Commission, the General Education Board, and the health officials of the federal government. They secured grant money uh, with the help of these agencies. Gray used his presidential muscle to influence uh, faculty and staff at FAMC to contribute at least $25 to the hospital building, stating that it is it was rather an expectation. In spite of the of his vigorous efforts to have a new hospital built, Gray was removed from office prior to the first cornerstone being laid. Not only did the institution undergo a brief period of building expansion under Gray's administration, it was also uh, it, it also went through a period of intellectual growth. Midway through his administration, Gray discovered that the state of Florida did not make any previous any provisions for graduate studies for African Americans in the state outside of the field of education. In his opinion, quote, the progressive trends of the state demand critical changes. Therefore, on April 2nd, 1945, Gray informed the executive committee of the college that the state board of control expressed a willingness to implement graduate work at the college and would ask for an appropriate form uh, appropriations from the legislature uh, to ensure this initiative was productive. 
with the inter with this intellectual growth, Gray recruited scholars to enhance scholarship at the college. The mass recruitment reached its pinnacle in 1946 when President Gray influ influenced 23 talented professors to render their services to the college. In this outstanding class were Wilbur, Wilbur L. Bates, Associate Professor of Agriculture, Charles U. Smith, Professor of Sociology, Sybil C. Mobley, Professor of the School of Business and Industry and Professional Accounting, William Patrick Foster, Chairman of the Department of Music and Director of Bands and Professor of Music. Foster recalls meeting Gray at a football game between Florida and m College and the Tuskegee Institute on, in October 1945. Among the fans and friends that observed the pregame and halftime show performed by the Tuskegee Institute Marching Band under his direction were Gray and Moses G. Miles, director of the student affairs at FAMC. After the game, the three gentlemen attended a meeting of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Before the meeting ended, Foster headed home around 11 or 11.30 p.m. fatigued. Shortly after reaching his home, he heard a knock at the door. To his surprise, it was Gray and Miles who were there to influence him to take the job at FAMC. Gray informed Foster that he wanted to put FAMC on the map. The offer was too good for Foster to turn down. Therefore, in the early spring of 1946, he made the trip to Tallahassee to meet Gray. The agenda of the meeting was to discuss expectations, needs, and resources. Shortly after, Foster accepted an appointment at Florida a and College effectively on June 1, 1946. Through the help of Foster and other members of the famous class of 46, FAMU stands as one of the nation's strongest and strongest institutions of academic excellence. Although Gray, uh, Gray had the school headed in the positive direction, his days would shortly be numbered. I'll stop there for uh, stop there now. Uh, but what I wanted to kind of highlight with Gray's uh, role with the university, not only does he lay the foundation to transition the university from college to university, the famous class of 46 is the class that really, one of the individuals that he also hired prior to 46 was a man by the name of Alonzo S. J. Gaither. And so the individuals that Gray hired really catapulted FAMC and Florida a &M University uh, to where they will eventually be in 1996-97, Princeton Time College of the Year. And so the foundation that he laid uh, back in 45 and 46 uh, is a benefit that the university in some ways still still lives on today. And in, in my assessment, also kind of put Florida, uh, the, the Tallahassee, Florida on the map as it relates to uh, the high achievements of uh, through from Florida and m College. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellis, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, yeah, we do have a few questions coming in. I will, as I said, I'll hold them till the end. If for whatever reason people can't stick around, I know that does happen. Um, this will be recorded, as I was mentioning before, this will all be recorded, so we will discuss the, the questions, and I've been told it should be up on our YouTube relatively quickly, the library's YouTube, so. Um, but next up is uh, Dr. Young, whenever you're ready. Right, thank you, and um, I do want to thank Eleanor and uh, you, Mackenzie, for reaching out and for organizing this program. I know how daunting of a task it can be um, in organizing and getting everyone together, especially historians uh, that do African-American history during Black History Month. So um, everything worked out in our schedule. And so I'm so glad to be here with you all, with the people who joined the call and with my colleagues, Dr. Matt Ewan and um, Dr. Ellis. Um, today, I'm going to talk more so about uh, Florida a in the context of the Black Power Movement. Um, I'm glad Dr. Ellis did just briefly mention uh, FAMU Hospital because that factors into some of the things that I will discuss today. I know we're on a strict time limit, so I will try to um, get through my, my, my few slides. I only have four or five slides uh, quickly, and then um, I'm looking forward to engaging with the audience with any questions that they may have. So I'll share my screen. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, so today I'm gonna to talk about black student power at Florida A&M. Um, really, we're looking at the post uh, 68 era um, and really the way that students at FAMU, students at HBCUs grappled with the direction of FAMU for the first time really uh, post 1964 Civil Rights Act is the first time really FAMU and other, uh, especially public HBCUs, have to grapple with the question in terms of the relevance of HBCUs in a post segregationist society. Um, because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, it allowed obviously for Black people to have more access to higher ed. Um, and questions began to circle among legislators, among the Board of Regents at that time about how uh, family would move forward and if it was still useful um, in an integrated post-segregationist climate. Um, as a result of that, really in the late 1960s, you start to see the radicalizing of students at, H at HBCUs. You start to see the radicalizing of the movement in general with the emergence of the Black Power Movement, especially in urban areas, but it takes on a different form when we look at it at historically Black co colleges and universities um, in terms of it, it becomes a movement, not necessarily just for some of the things that we associate with the Panthers or other Black Power organizations in terms of police brutality and those things, students did speak out on those issues. But what was core to the Black student movement during that era was preserving historically Black colleges and universities. And I wanted to just touch on a couple things from that era. April 4th, 1968, um, the undisputed leader and um, icon of the movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee at the Lorraine Motel. Um, Dr. King had a huge influence on the students at FAMU. Um, he comes to FAMU in 1956 when the world is still just learning about who this 26, 27 year old preacher is. Uh, to help the students organize along with C.K. Steele in the 1956 Tallahassee bus boycott. Um, FAMU students are at the forefront of student movements uh, because of that involvement in that, in that historic uh, demonstration. Of course, uh, by the early 1960s, in 1960, in fact, um, you start to see the sit-in movement led by Patricia and Priscilla Stevens and the emergence of the Congress of Racial Equality on campus. Uh, King uh, periodically still comes back uh, to Tallahassee. He's close with C.K. Steele. C.K. Steele is his right-hand man, his uh, second in command with the SCLC. And so when we look at the reaction as news spread that this uh, figure who was so important to Black people in general but it takes on something different when we look at FAMU because of how closely he was affiliated with the university and how deeply involved FAMU students were in the movement. And so um, in the aftermath of King's assassination, we see unrest and rebellions erupt uh, throughout the nation in hundreds of cities um, and Tallahassee is also one of those cities in particular when we look at the areas around Florida A&M University. Um, right here we have a little clip on from April 5th, 1968. And um, it gives you a glimpse, right? I think it's important to have more detailed conversation of, about Dr. King. Dr. King in many ways has been sanitized and um, his legacy and how he was treated has uh, really uh, been covered up and really uh, reduced to kind of this non-controversial um, moment, right? Or, or really just to the last stanzas of the I Have a Dream speech. Um, but I think it's extremely important to have some honest conversations about who Dr. King was and what he endured 
uh, during that time period, right? The opening sentence from the Democrat is we have not approved of the tactics of King, right? And from there, they go on to express their sorrow and also uh, continue to say how he kind of invoked this. And this was kind of a, um, something that he wanted, right? Ultimately, in terms of the way that he approached um, the movement. Um, King, in many ways, um, and especially in, in looking at the Tallahassee Democrat and how it treated King, uh, in the 50s and 60s, right? You would often have op-eds when he would be called bigot, a bigot. He was, uh, his Christianity was questioned. His leadership tactics were questioned, right? Um, and so you get a, a kind of a lens into that. And I've had some conversations about King and what he experienced, not just here in Tallahassee, but throughout the uh, world and especially throughout the nation. Um, last month during his holiday, uh, uh, birthday celebrations, right? Um, so that gives you a lens into that. But once the word spreads, right, and once it's announced that Dr. King had been assassinated, um, the campus community is just stunned. Students are pouring out of their dorms, crying, sobbing in a quadrangle. Uh, students um, from there, because they are veterans of the movement, began to have small demonstrations. Some began to sing uh, the battle hymns of the civil rights movement, the We Shall Overcomes and things of that nature. But there's also another more radical element that is already on campus by April 4th, 1968. And so those We Shall Overcome anthems and the singing is being drowned, drowned out by chants of black power. And you start to see those peaceful demonstrations that the students participated in for over a decade at that point um, become angrier and angrier. Because the one person who was willing to stand up and to preach and teach and talk about nonviolence is taken in such a violent way. And so the hope is taken from the students, the hope is taken from the Black community and I think it's important to understand that King had to teach nonviolence and that's not the normal way individuals respond to the type of situations that they were in. And so that anger begins to build on campus and it spills out on the street. The students stood on the outskirts of the campus and as cars would, would drive by, they would yell out uh, black if it was in uh, driven by black. Um, drivers, right? And if a white cup, a white, um, some white folks drove by, then they would start throwing bo bottles and bricks and anything that they could grab, right? And they would do that for the next few hours until the police came and circled the campus. Um, as you move into the night, uh, the students are really on the top of the hill. If you think about where railroad is and family way and all those things. Now, uh, the students were at the top of the hill and they engage in a shootout with the police, right? That they begin to shoot rifles at the police. Um, the police are under orders not to return fire in any circumstance. Uh, but this will happen for hours. Some students climbed the trees and began to shoot uh, target tip arrows at the police as well, right? Not, found that to be interesting until I learned more about the archery classes that were on campus. I'm like, why are the students having <laughs> bows and arrows in, in their dorms, right? Uh, but that went on for hours until the uh, police finally were able to get tear gas and they launched it on the hill um, and the students retreated back to their dorms. The following day, um, the students had a convocation at Lee Hall 2000 students went to the convocation. Uh, president Gore is trying to calm the students. Benjamin L. Perry, who would later be uh, president, the Dean of Students is trying to calm the students. And again, went through the same, um, same chronological order where it's crying, it's singing, it's shouting, it's protests. And then finally the students became angry again. They took to the streets once more um, and destroyed a white owned 
laundromat that was on campus and things of that nature. And again, this happened uh, for a matter of three days until President Gore decided to close the campus and send the students home for two weeks. When the Tallahassee Democrat wrote about what happened, they talked about how it was just a spontaneous outburst as if everything was okay on the campus prior to that. And uh, part of what I'm doing with this article that I'm writing on um, the FAMU student rebellion is to talk about the underlying issues that preceded it. The black power movement was fully in swing by 1967. This is a famous picture of Stokely Carmichael on a place us Rattlers affectionately call the set on campus and you can see the hundreds of students who came to watch him give this speech. He's standing on the hood of a car giving a speech because President Gore would not allow him to go into the buildings. A lot of this is because of Claude Kirk and some of the direct orders he was receiving from the governor not to allow him in his state owned buildings. And he gives this speech and he was on his tour touring all these black college uh, campuses uh, talking about the larger issues associated with black power, police brutality, some of these issues who, which are still very much um, uh, relevant today. From there, you know, he riled up the students, he got them going. If you ever heard Stokely speak, you can, you know what type of powerful speaker he was. Um, and he told them that they ought to be ashamed of themselves, that they won't allow him to, them to bring in the speakers that they want to speak in their buildings and this and that. And that same crowd rushes over to Lee Hall. They break the chains on Lee Hall and he continues that speech in there. This is a year prior to King's assassination. Um, so some people will tie this just to the change in the movement and youthful rebellion, rebelliousness, but there were some real underlying issues that were, was happening um, that year as well. That same month, the state legislature um, decided to close Florida a and Law School. As you can see, the College of Law, um, as for FSU and some of the things that were happening prior to that, right? Um, and in that, so in that same legislative session, they decided to close the doors at Family Law School and they provided the seed money for what would later become the FSU College of Law. Um, that same legislative session, they decided to effectively close FAMU Hospital now that TMH had been uh, integrated. Um, that for years, for two or three years, the FAMU Hospital was not receiving a certain amount of funding uh, because of the Civil Rights Act, which provided uh, set penalties to FAMU Hospital for not desegregating. And it wasn't that FAMU Hospital said, didn't say to the white community that they couldn't come, but obviously um, they were less likely to come, right? And definitely went to TMH as opposed to FAMU Hospital. And that caused issues in terms of not showing that you're desegregating, which you know led to a host of other um, funding issues that happened with the law school. So by 67, they decided to lease it to the city for a dollar a year. Um, so from 67 to um, 71 is known as the Tallahassee A&M Hospital. And this was really just to wait for TMH to complete an expansion so that they can now house and deal with the black community that um, obviously did not have the opportunity to go to TMH prior to um, the 1960s. Um, so this is happening, and then there's these ongoing talks about merger. That same legislative session, they're saying they're going to merge FAMU with Florida State. Uh, one of the student leaders and this article right here is actually, the irony of this article is that it was published in the Florida Flambeau, which is Florida State's um, um, student publication. And it was published on April 4th, 1968 to give you a sense of what was happening on campus. It was published the day that King was assassinated. And one of the student leaders said, you know, if they merge FAMU with Florida State, we're gonna burn down every building on their campus, 
right? And even the alumni association president said, um, you can't really see it, but maybe it's time to riot, right? So you could get a sense of what the climate was like on campus the day of King's assassination. That ran that morning by that evening, everyone had learned that the icon of the civil rights movement had died um, and you saw students just take it to the streets, not only to mourn and to react to Dr. King, but out of a sense of we're going to do whatever it takes to protect our institutions because the way that we went about securing rights in this country has not been um, effective in their minds in that moment. When we look at the legacy of the Black student movement on campus, um, one of the direct reflections of it is the creation of African American studies at FAMU. Um, you can see in line six, one of the things they talk about is securing an Afro-American studies program. This opens uh, in the academic year of 7071, and I'm proud to say that we are celebrating the 50th anniversary this year of Black Studies at FAMU, which has a direct correlation to the activism that came during this era. So um, I know there's probably a lot of questions, a lot of things I skipped over, but I will stop there. And um, I'm looking forward to engaging in any conversation that you all may have. Thank you so much, though. We do actually have a few, uh, sorry, there was a bit of a discussion happening behind me, so I want to say muted. Um, but we have a few questions that actually have come in. Thank you again, everyone, for those wonderful presentations. Uh, going in order, the very first one we received actually goes to, I believe it's stretched towards Dr. Uh, Medewin, which is, uh, does the archive have records of land owned by free Blacks post-Civil War in Leon and Gadsden counties? Okay, so the archives does not have those type of records, but I will say the FSU has, um, they have bank bank records that could help with some of that gene genealogy, um, but uh, the, the Black Archives on FAMU's campus does not. Let me make sure I'm not missing any so far. The next question I had come up was, uh, did Dr. King's visits create more networking and solidarity between movements in Florida and how involved were students in other places in Florida with these movements? Right, um, so I teach a civil rights class at FAMU. And one of the things that I talk about, um, I obviously talk about the importance of King, but I also talk about just how unique that movement is. and. Um, so I don't necessarily want to attribute it to Dr. King coming here as opposed to a younger generation who are willing to work together to solve some of these issues. So you do see a um, coalition between um, FAMU and, you know, progressive students who are at Florida State, um, even in the 1950s, but definitely throughout the sit-in movements in the early 1960s, you see that type of uh, movement. Uh, one of the I think slides, I had a newspaper article just to show you what was happening in 67, where the students at FAMU, um, you know, were going through these talks of merger. And it was students at Florida State, both white and black, and students at the University of Florida, both white and black, who came together to organize a tour of the state to talk about why this is wrong and how um, in a post-segregationist society, why is it always almost that Black institutions have to deal with the question of whether or not it's relevant when be, the reason why we have a family is a direct <laughs> correlation, because, you know, directly relates to um, Jim Crow and racism that was meant to uh, keep Black people in a uh, subservient type position, right? And so um, you do see a interracial coalition, and that's a big part of understanding the Congress of Racial Equality and CORE during that period. Um, and so, yes, yes, you do see cooperation between FAMU, UF, and FSU, especially in the 1960s. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question coming up, which I, I didn't even concern this, and this is a, 
I mean, these are all interesting, great questions. Thank you. Please keep them coming. Uh, can anyone talk about the creation of the FSU FAMU College in, of Engineering in the sense of uh, why did it play out differently than the decision to close FAMU Law for the FSU Law School? Dr. Ellis might be able to speak more about, um, about that, but I will say when you look at um, the way that Florida a and was set up, when you look at Jim Crow and quote unquote separate but equal and things of that nature, that programs that FAMU's really um, sister institution is the University of Florida. I think that's fair to say. Dr. Ellis is a, an expert on higher education, so I defer to him typically. And so programs that were given and created at UF uh, would ultimately be created at FAMU, which makes FAMU very different than most state supported HBCUs when you think about the College of Engineering, the College of Law, the College of Pharmacy, the College of Architecture, and some of these other very signature programs that you won't see at uh, many state um, institutions, right? Um, but Dr. Ellis, do you have anything you can add about specifically, I guess, the College of Engineering? No, I think you uh, you kind of really laid the foundation for it. When you look at particularly what was going on with the uh, the the College of Engineering as it relates to why didn't it um, uh, why didn't it close, uh, if you will, and and um, why was there a joint program? Well, Florida and M, uh, as we all know, uh, was actually in line to get the College of Engineering uh, earlier. However, uh, when the state appropriations came out, it did come out for it to be both uh, a joint program. Started out, as you all know, that Florida and M University handled the budget uh, and Florida State handled the administrative apparatus in about uh, the uh, mid 2000s that uh, that shifted from the uh, administrative component going to Florida a &M and the uh, financial component uh, going uh, to Florida State. Um, as it relates to the law school, why didn't it go down in the same way? Well, I think Dr. Young really, uh, uh, again, laid the foundation for what, what, what was going on with both of these programs. When we look at the history of Florida a and &M, the agricultural and mechanical and being a land grant university, our sister school here really is uh, the University of Florida. So um, these particular programs uh, were supposed to be for uh, African-Americans in the state of Florida because prior to uh, desegregation, African-Americans in the state of Florida could not get into the University of Florida. So. Uh, these programs were designed and set up for uh, African Americans in the state of Florida. Prior, so post um, integration, there was a concerted uh, attempt to either a close Florida and them all together, but prior to closing it all together, was to merge some of the programs into Florida State. So the funding for the law school really, law school didn't lose accreditation or anything; it just didn't get funded. <laughs> and right. so, and so once the the funding left, um, the 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 funding went across the street to to uh, uh, Florida State. So if you come to campus right now and come to Coleman Library on the side of the library, you will see Family College of Law still on the building. Um, and so, and then of course it goes the the stacks uh, in the uh, Florida State College of Law Library. You will still see some of the books that had the stamp of the College of Law. One of the, the presidents who was at the, who was here at the time uh, with the fight to keep the, uh, keep a portion of the College of uh, Engineering was a guy by the name of Dr. Walter Smith. And he was a part, I mean, he was a student uh, when the when the university lost the, the law school. And so uh, these individuals were fighting um, uh, on the surface and above the surface to ensure that family still had access to that type of program. And I'll say this and I'll close it out, is that from about the mid 1960s throughout the early 90s, um, those mergers and those closures were a very sore spot for FAM UNs, uh, uh, individuals who uh, were faculty, staff, students, uh, alum, but not just FAM UNs, but African Americans in the region. 
those mergers and closures were sore spots because uh, it was very apparent that there was a, an institutional attack on the university in response to desegregation. So when the, when the nation was being desegregated, institutions of higher learning, state supported institutions of higher learning uh, were, were being critically attacked and the, the programs that were being attacked were the programs of influence. Our law school program, Dr. Young is an expert on the, on the hospital, that program was attacked. College of Engineering, as it even in its infancy, uh, was being attacked. And so many of the, the high water mark programs at these institutions of higher learning, particularly HBCUs, were being attacked um, um, in response, if you will, to desegregation. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure which one is piggybacking off of me, the very last one, but there's a mention of, uh, and I, I will get to the, the Stokely Carmichael one. I realize I ordered those wrong. I just feel this while we're in this zone. Uh, to piggyback off the previous question, why was the hospital closed and not reopened? I'm not sure. Right, so, yeah, I can, um, I can answer that. Um, the hospital really becomes a casualty, one of these unintended casualties of the civil rights movement. And so you have federal legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, which you know, um, said that all these public facilities needed to desegregate or face federal uh, penalties. Um, so that plays a role in terms of fam, you not being able to prove that they have uh, white patients. Uh, there are some efforts that were made to hire black, I'm sorry, white uh, administrators and doctors at the hospital, um, but they're never ever, you know, never able to prove that they can get white patients. So that um, led to some penalties, financial penalties uh, uh, against the hospital, but really the hospital just was never properly funded uh, by the state. You know, um, this, when we again talk about separate but equal, the FAMU, the way it's set up, UF of course has Shands Hospital, Florida A&M had um, this hospital which served black folks for I think a 200 plus mile radius, the only hospital in the entire region. And if you were black and you were born from 1950 through the late 1960s in Tallahassee, you were either born at home via a midwife or at a family hospital. Um, but it was never properly funded. Um, you, you know, that's a whole nother conversation in terms of um, the way schools are funded and have historically been funded. Um, but that was definitely um, a major issue. But by 1967, again, it's this push to kind of cripple the university because of a push really that was being led by um, Bob Graham. I, you know, I don't know if I should put anything out there like that, but Graham is one of the main people who pushed to merge family with Florida State. Um, but it's hard to do it when you have these signature programs, especially when we think about family hospital and the potential it has when you consider the medical programs with the nursing school, the nurses trained there, the pharmacy program here, and all these things that it did from an academic perspective, let alone, you know, what it did to serve the Black community and the bridge that it uh, built between the hospital, between the university and the Black community, that those things were, you know, those two areas were synonymous and largely in part because of the hospital, but funding plays a big role. Um, you start to see again leased out in '67, and um, the students they you know raised hell about it in 1970, protested, protested, demonstrations, did all these things throughout that entire year. 1971, the hospital is closed on literally Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1971, and without any warning, you know the state comes in, they hand pink slips to everybody at the hospital on Christmas Eve, which was strategic because the students were at home and it wasn't gonna be that type of reaction. So 
Um, it's closed, it's closed permanently. Um, it becomes an admin building um, at FAMU that is still in operation today. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's the unfortunate, unfortunate story of the hospital, but it has so much potential when we think about um, the current state that we're in and some of the things that we could do to alleviate some of the medical inequities that we see in, a, in, in the city. If I may, very quickly, I did see a question. I know we, we're running out of time. I did see a question re regarding will FAMU Medical School come back. But I hope there's a real strong consideration uh, in the state to think about uh, establishing a medical school here at Florida a &M University. Uh, because when you look at what's going on with COVID-19 and the disparities uh, of as it relates to African Americans who, who get COVID and die from it, it shows that there's a real health disparity, uh, uh, you know, racial disparity in, in health. Um, so one of the things that we have to look at is from a research perspective, you know, uh, why, why, why are African Americans dying at a higher rate from diseases like COVID and other individuals? Do we have access to health care? And is there access to health care uh, in Black communities? How many individuals of color uh, are, have uh, opportunity to become uh, medical doctors. And I think when you look at how Florida a &M University is strategically set up, we have allied health, uh, 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 nursing, pharmacy, pharmaceutical sciences. Uh, we are really almost set up to be a medical school. So I think that if the state of Florida is serious about really tackling major health disparities, not only in the state of Florida, but also in the region, they were starting to consider um, a medical school here at Florida a &M University. And that, that's my two cents as a historian on that. Yeah, I wanted to add something briefly to um, the history of the uh, hospital and the FAMU's position in the United States actually is a research entity. Uh, if you have the chance um, to call over to the museum on campus, the Black Archives, we have an exhibit that spans a hallway and includes the history of the hospital going back to 1911 and intellectual property in the fields of pharmacy research, nursing research. Uh, there are a lot of firsts, a lot of cornerstones and medical research and triumphs that are illustrated in this exhibit. And you will see why uh, FAMU has long since, since 1911, made a good case for the advancement of medicine and the ingenuity that comes from FAMU. So uh, I, I do support uh, Dr. Ellis and his points there. On that note, I think we're out of time at this point. Thank you all so much for your presentations. And Millie, I know that you were the one to close us up. So I just wanted to cue you in and thank all three of you again. This has been fantastic and just both incredibly educational and revealing, just enjoyable. So you all have given great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, okay, yes. Um, okay. So yes, yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Matt Yoon, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Young for that um, those amazing presentations, a great kind of three snapshots of three different periods of history and and kind of connecting to physical locations that we're all pretty familiar with was fascinating and we cannot thank you enough we were thrilled to be able to hear it uh and the link that i just dropped uh, the link i just dropped is for a program that we're that the library is actually doing tomorrow which is the african-american this is more aimed at family so you are interested in something that's kind of uh, aimed, uh, aimed at a, a younger crowd, um, head right straight to that link and sign up for that one because it's a fun program as well. Uh, and uh, let me add uh, that we can just say again thank you to our distinguished professors thank you to everyone for coming to this really exciting presentation we'll see you next time okay thank you again